Well, I'm very excited to be here with Peter Case today. Thank you, Peter, for taking time oh, yeah, being with us here, man. Yeah. Oh, glad, glad to be here. <laughs> very good, very good. Well, Peter, there's, I have a lot of questions for you, man, and uh, I want to start off by talking about a very successful Kickstarter campaign uh, that you did in, I think it commenced, commenced in October of 2015. Um, a lot of artists that we've talked to have been using uh, crowdsourcing or crowdfunding as a way of really connecting with fans and, and getting needed capital to put out um, releases. And the last uh, campaign that you guys did was pretty successful, right? Yeah, we made the record. You know, you wouldn't be able to make the records these days. Uh, without something like that so that yeah. that seems to be the mode currently yeah and so yeah it went great we made this record called Highway 62 uh, Ben Harper's on it uh, DJ Bonebreak yeah. from X uh, yeah. Ben Harper you know he's a, a guy I met up at his uh, family store out in Claremont you know oh, the wow. music store up there wow. and uh, it's a place I play a lot and uh, he's a great guy he came down and really dove in to the project but yeah. but the Kickstarter yeah got it going and paid a lot of the bills and all that but uh, yeah. you know it's a weird process you know it's yeah. uh, it's a funny time you know yeah. seems like all the money vanished out of this uh, society somehow <laughs> and like now now the record companies never have any money and they yeah. can't sell any records and nobody pays for like you know they don't get any money and then you don't get any and then like your yeah. fans pay and then, yeah. you know, I don't yeah. know it's crazy man and then uh, you know yeah, I want to ask rich you about that. richer and the poor get poor, man, you know. Social stratification, indeed. And, you know, that was actually a perfect segue, Peter, because, uh, you know, of course, like the big the big area, you know, record labels, I mean, when the Plimsolls came out and, and other, you know, deals, even into the 90s, you know, a lot of artists, you know, you sign a contract, you get fronted money, you're pretty well set. And um, things have, so many artists that we've talked to, really big, big name artists, um, who are now using the crowd sourcing or crowdfunding model um, who do not have label support. It's becoming kind of the norm to not have record label support for a lot of artists, it seems like. I don't know. Oh, yeah, there's no record label support. Even yeah. if you're on a record label, there's yeah. no record label support. I mean, there wasn't that much, let's be honest, you know, back in the day. I mean, it was all really dysfunctional, you know. They, <laughs> they had money and they'd throw it around, but they never knew what they were doing with it. And yeah. people were stealing money from them out left and right. And oh, really? they were spending, oh, come on, okay. man. Okay. You know, you I mean, know. For, you, for you looking back, I mean, the, especially the, the heyday of the, the nerves, the plim souls, et cetera. I mean, do you look back and I mean, did you guys made, you know, do you get still get good residuals or were you kind of bilked out of out of deals with the contracts that were being uh, signed back then? Well, it's complicated, man. But, uh, you know, bilked is an interesting word. Um, you know, uh, it, yeah, the, all, whatever. Like I used to always assume that uh, that after I'd written and recorded like, you know, 250, 300 songs and, and gone out and done all that thing. They'd all been published and had a lot of people that there that, that would sort of be my pension, you know, but yeah. like that's not happening because, but it's, but it's not because of the deal so much that I did with the record companies. Yeah. It's because of uh, Spotify and YouTube and uh, oh, okay. these things, they don't pay. Yeah. And so like I had 1.6 million listens of a million miles away and you get a check for like, you know, you know, 20 bucks or something like wow. that, you know, and so if you had like a billion, maybe you could get like a used car wow. or something like that. So, I mean, you know, it's yeah, like, yeah. I've it's heard not... some horror stories like uh, Damon from uh, Damon and Naomi Galaxy 500 wrote something. And, wrote a great piece and, about it. Yeah. Know, really breaking down the economies of scale and talking about, how, you know, getting a check for 20 bucks after, you know, millions of listens. It's well, it's so, crazy. Yeah. You know, and it's it's like uh, there's a lot of arguing about it, but other people are getting rich over it, you know, including the people that make these things. And so, yeah. so, uh, you know, like the content is what makes these things like you wouldn't want to have it if it didn't have all that content sure. but you know p content providers especially of the you know uh, the musical kind are, are yeah. getting um, pretty much getting ripped off yeah. blind yeah. but there's nothing really you can do about it until the laws change you know yeah. Yeah. and the laws aren't going to change uh, you know the strange thing about it is like uh, well I don't even want to get into the, the politics about it but yeah. but uh, David Lowry does a really good job of talking about it yeah. and uh, if you check out his site called the Tricordist you know, but Lowry uh, is really pretty much a spokesman right now because he's got like kind of a uh, economic, you know, degree. You know, he teaches economics down yeah. down in Georgia, yeah. and so mm -hmm. besides leading Cracker and Camper Van Beethoven, yeah. so he's an interesting person and he's very smart. And he, you know, if you check out what he's saying about yeah. it, it's all pretty much. Yeah spot on you know we've, we've had the pleasure of interviewing david and um victor from camper van beethoven oh, yeah. and uh, david's very outspoken about kind of the economy of being an artist and it's that's, kind of bl blowing the lid off all the myths that exist about oh, yeah, that it's yeah. ridiculous being an artist like you know you're basically doing it for uh uh you know you're living by your wits and the, the, you know there's no there's no uh not it's, as, it's not as glamorous as people think sometimes or, or 
the joy of it is being an artist, you know. But but uh, you know the 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 burden of it is that you you know a lot of you know the dentists have all the good guitars and the lawyers and the uh, and people with professional jobs and stuff. While I'm playing, you know, I love my guitars, but I'm not I'm not playing um, the kind of guitars my you know my like a dentist would play or something. Like that. <laughs> that's a really quotable moment. I'm not. That's going to be a song on your next album. I love that title. It won't well, be, but. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, Peter, one of the things I really admire about you, man, amongst many things, is you know we're here at a very cool DIY crowdsourced event here in Eagle Rock, California, with some friends of ours, and um, you're 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 an artist that's I would. I would put the label of being a very accessible artist, somebody who's really able to connect with fans, always sort of available to, um, you know, put yourself out there to perform, and, and I really respect that, and I think tonight is going to be uh, a real good example of that. But one question I had relating to this is that you've been doing a lot of um, singer, uh, I guess, songwriting workshops, and uh, had a lot of... Um, you know, really good um, receptivity to that. And I just kind of wanted to ask about what's that like as a musician to teach other people how to write songs? Um, what what can you tell us about that process? You know, the songwriting thing is great. Yeah, people love to write songs. I mean, uh, it's a very fun thing to do and very satisfying. And you can, you know, you know, I can't say you, you know, it, there's aspects of it that are are more elusive to teach. Mm. And there's other aspects. The thing I teach and which people like me can bring are like the, um, the, the rudiments, you know, the basics, the, basics yeah. the, 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 the things like, you know, the, the first 10 years, you know, Another, and then you can yeah. talk about things that would happen in the last 10 years, latest thing, you know, yeah. the things that, you know, more sophisticated things. I talk, I can talk to, to people like that almost like peers, you know, mm -hmm. but, but really like I can help people do a lot, you know, like I had to invent the wheel as a kid because like, you know, you had to figure out how to do it yourself and that was cool, but yeah. it took a long time. And there was a lot of, you know, you can kind of, give people some shortcuts to it and yeah, so not, yeah. not not shortcuts to the art but shortcuts to um getting moving with it you know yeah. and so uh so when it's been a popular and people really like it i have people that take the classes over and over and over again and i'm up in san francisco and i'm doing it again this summer i okay. do it between tours i started doing it when my kid you know my kids are big now but like yeah. when, when they were little i did it so that, that i wouldn't um you know, so I would have something to do between, I wouldn't always be on the road, yeah, you know. Yeah. I was still doing 100 gigs a year, but I would have something to do at home, you know. Kind of that, a different side. Peter, the, the teacher, kind of out there doing your thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're just leading a workshop with people and trying to turn them on to it. You know, I don't get too much into, like, I'm the, I'm the teacher or anything like that. But, but uh, yeah, People don't uh, call you professor or anything like that actually, when you do. Alejandro Escovito does call me the professor, <laughs> okay. but I don't know. I think it's because I wear glasses. Okay. Or, he wears glasses, too. I don't know why he calls know. me that. He's always called me that, though. <laughs> but, uh, um, very cool, very cool. Yeah, it's fun to do. Yeah. I like people, and I like talking about things I care about, and, yeah. and so I enjoy doing it. Cool. And, and so I've been doing it at Blue Bear Music. I'm doing it again this summer. Nice, nice. Well, Peter, there's, you know, another thing I know about you is there's kind of a literary side to you. Uh, you wrote an autobiography in 2007, and a lot of the artists that we've interviewed, uh, Ben Watt, uh, Hugh Cornwall from The Stra Stranglers, um, so many artists are writing, have or are in the process of writing autobiographies. I wanted to ask you a little bit about what that process was like for you. I mean, was it cathartic? Did it bring up uh, strong emotions that had laid dormant for many years? I mean, what, what was that process like? Well... You know, I've written a lot of it, but I've only published about um, 50 pages of it, and and uh, so I got a smaller book that like is a piece of it. I don't know. Uh, when I did it, the first time I did it was like 10 years ago, and there weren't a, it was before anybody else. There have weren't all these biographies out, and then like the world, I was taking time with mine, but then the whole world published a rock autobiography, and so, uh, you know, I may not even publish mine now. But really? but, okay. but but I thought it was published, so I'm actually it, well, a, a, a part of it is published okay. on. Uh, Never the more books out of Atlanta published this one book and it was okay. very popular. It sold you know thousands of copies. Gotcha. It was called As Far As You Can Get Without a Passport. But it's it, that was a book. The reason that book work turned out nice was because it's not really a rock autobiography. It's the story of what happened really before I got in bands, and so it's more of just sort of a story, you know, yeah. about somebody trying to find their way. Yeah. You know? Wasn't it more specifically from your hometown out to San Francisco, right? It was Kinda. yeah, like a little bit about the hometown, and then a landing in San Francisco yeah. and playing on the street was what it's about. Gotcha. And so it was a pr period of my life where like I was really experiencing a little, like you know a whole you know bouquet of emotions involving you know freedom, but you know yeah. terror. Kind of singing troubadour kind of. Uh, I don't or know. No, that's kind of you know a cliche, okay. but it was like kind of being like a young kid living on the street playing guitar and trying to find his way playing music. I mean, the only place you could play, really play music 
um, at that point, you know, uh, would be on the street because, yeah. uh, you know, you weren't good enough to play in the clubs yeah. and uh, there wasn't really a band scene for anybody except older people. Yeah. And so uh, we just kind of made our own scene on the street. Now that ended up being a really cool street scene and that's where the nerves came out of it. And uh, um, we met as street musicians. Yeah. And you were featured in a documentary, right, that, that kind of highlighted you and, and raised some, some yeah, attention. You can see it online. It was on yeah. Vimeo for a while, yeah. and it still might be. And I, I post parts of it every once in a while on yeah. uh, Facebook. Okay. And um, it was made by a guy who he was going to the Art Institute of San Francisco, and, and uh, he, uh, San Francisco Art Institute, and he uh, made a film. Otto Preminger's son lit it, and it okay. looks really yeah. great. Nice. It's kind of a documentary of, like, on the street in San Francisco in 1973, so it's yeah. inter interesting just to see everybody's, you know, flare pants yeah. and, you know, yeah, yeah. long hair and, like, you know, yeah. some guy breaks a popper under my nose. And, <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, I didn't know. I didn't really want him to do that. Were you, were you on Hate Street? I mean, what, what area of San Francisco? No, I was in North Beach. North Beach, okay. And, you know, I mean, I was up on Hate Street. I would okay. go there, but you couldn't play on the street up there because everybody was poverty stricken up there. So gotcha. we would go down to uh, North Beach. We'd play the tourists during the day, and at night we'd play up for, you know, nightclubbers. Gotcha. Very cool, very cool. Well, Peter, I wanted to ask you about those early days. I'm a huge fan of all of your work, of course, but the early stuff with the nerves, um, you know, really, really like that stuff. And you guys, in reading up about kind of the history of the nerves and then ultimately the plimsolls, I mean, you guys, when you moved to L.A. in 1977, I want to ask you about what the scene was like. We've interviewed a lot of folks that from the late 70s, early 80s who played it, like Madame Wong's and different places like that. Um, what was the scene when you guys uh, came down to L.A. Uh, in 77? Well, there was no Madame Wong's. No. And there was no, no punk rock. Okay. And uh, the whiskey wasn't really booking local bands. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they wouldn't book any... And uh, we put on the first bands that were so that we met here were the Weirdos. They didn't have a drummer yet, and so they didn't want to play. So we talked them into playing, and uh, they told me they'd find a drummer if they played. We and I'm, we booked the first punk rock shows in uh, wow. Southern California. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and in, that in talking to other artists, um, in talking to the Damned, they talked about how the Dick Dickies were really supportive of them here in the late '70s. And I've heard the same thing from other artists that a lot of um, you know punk or alternative bands, there wasn't really a lot of venues that, um, if they thought the crowd was a certain type of crowd, they they wouldn't book certain artists at certain venues. Um, so it was a kind of an impen impenetrable um, kind of marketplace for certain artists. Is that? Is that what you guys experienced? Or? I'm not sure what you're saying about the Dickies yeah. and the Damned, but um, yeah, there was a lot of nonsense. There was like a lot of different sides. Yeah. It was it was always something. You had to fight your way in. So that's why we yeah. started booking our own. We started renting out halls and booking our own shows, and that's how we put on the Germs, the nice. Zeros, the Weirdos, nice. um, all those bands' first gigs, the Dills nice. um, in L.A. Those were the first gigs. Um, and then we split and went off and toured with the Ramones as their opening act. Read that, yeah. Mm. Wow. That's yeah. pretty, pretty amazing stuff. And ultimately, also with Devo and one of my favorite bands of all time, Per Ubu. I love those guys. Yeah, and we you played in Cleveland with those guys before anybody knew who they were out here. But that was uh, a big eye-opener for us, too, you know, yeah, yeah. to go play with those guys. Like, like on one night, they, we did two different nights at a club called Pirates Club. And on one, the first night, it was Devo. And the second night, it was Per Ubu with us. You know, op they were the opening acts, you know. And then the Dead Boys came to the show, you know. Nice, nice. And so it was pretty trippy. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It was a real a lot of fun, you know. And that summer... Of 77, you know? Yeah, yeah. Good stuff happening there. Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, through the years, uh, Peter, you've, you're an artist also who's done a lot of collaborations. You mentioned earlier your mo more recent work, a studio release with DJ Bone Break, Ben Harper, and others. Through the years, I mean, are there some any other artists that you've had the uh, luxury of uh, gracing the stage with that really stand out in your memory? Uh, musical collaborations, either in the studio or live performances? That... No, that's a good question. There's probably a lot of them, so it's a... Well, maybe it's hard top, to say. It's top, hard. top five, maybe? Or? Top five. It's hard to think, you know. Yeah. People were making lists on some of those social sites, and at some point I had, like, you know, 500 people I'd played on. Oh, wow. I mean, yeah. I can't really think, man, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I played with everybody from, uh, you know, Bonnie Raitt, U2, yeah. R.E.M., yeah. Bobby Womack. Oh, nice. nice. That'd probably be one of the big ones. Okay. Uh, Allen Ginsberg. Wow. That was when I was on the street. Accompanying him doing poetry, like yeah, yeah, he was making up songs on the street corner with us. Oh wow! That's and cool. uh, that was fun. He did that over a period of a week in '74. Wow, nice. 
and uh, who else? You know, the millions of people. Yeah. I, ca I can't remember them all. You know, yeah. um, I I used to go over to Willie Dixon's house and uh, wow. make up songs with him, and uh, that was a lot of fun. And uh, you know, I played with John Prine. You know, that was a lot of a lot of fun. And Steve Earle. You know, me and him had a battle doing cocaine blues, making up new verses for that oh, one wow. night. And, <laughs> Uh, you know, Guy Clark and, oh, yeah, God, just yeah. so many people, man. Yeah. I mean, I just can't even start to think it, about it. It's, for some artists, when we ask that question, it's an easy question because they haven't done a lot of collaborations. But I guess it is kind of an unfair uh, sort of hardball pitch to you because you have done so many. So I I, uh, I will it's recuse my... hardball <laughs> pitch, but I mean, I just get, I mean, it's easy because I, I can yeah. just start, you know, uh, you know, I remember playing a lot of different gigs, you know, a lot of different shows, man. Yeah. Uh, you know, we played with Petty. Tom Petty sang with the Plimsolls at the Whiskey the night the Whiskey closed down for the first time. That was a lot of fun, you know. Uh, what was what's that song? Uh, I woke up this morning, got myself a beer. I played that with Ray Manzarek one time. Oh, wow, wow, wow. I mean, you know, Simple, so yeah. many different things. I mean, you know, it's just a million of them. So I really can't. Um, yeah. Trying to remember, like you know, something that really stood out, you know. Uh, well, they all sound like beautiful, memorable memories, so so it, it's hard to kind of uh, rank them. This year was the 30th anniversary of your first solo LP, and Omnivore Records, uh, I guess, repressed it. They did a beautiful package for it, yeah. and it's got seven new songs. So it's got the oh, original nice. 12 songs okay. and seven outtakes from it that are pretty cool. I wrote notes for it and stuff, so that's cool. Yeah, it's okay. exciting to have it come out. Yeah, that was a pretty seminal release. A lot of people exposed to your solo work, obviously, through that release. So uh, well, A lot of people got back into the whole idea of singer-songwriters. I was sort of the first person from the punk generation to go solo acoustic. Yeah. You know, different people had done a couple of acoustic products, but I was the first person to kind of turn into, like, a rock and roll folk singer on the road, you know, and, sure. and, I, and uh, nobody even knew you could do that. In fact, people still don't really know you can do it. Only a few people do it, <laughs> all, like, as much as me, but... Um, yeah, it's cool having it come out after th all that time. It's hard to believe it was that long, you know, yeah. but uh, I guess yeah, it 1986 is. doesn't seem like that long ago, right? I don't know. It depends. A couple of those nights were pretty long in there, you know, <laughs> along the way. But, you know, <laughs> but uh, things are cool, you know. Uh, I'm happy to have that come out, you know. It's yeah. exciting. So I'll be on the tour, you know, sub you know yeah. supporting that, I suppose you would say. All right. Very cool. We're looking forward to that. Definitely want to check out the re-release on Omnivore Records and uh, wish you, Mr. Peter Case, all the best in all, all of right, your... Man. Thanks a lot. Thanks, man. man. Good luck with you, all your adventures out here and uh, see you down the road. All right. All right.